Well, as we close out the year, let's talk about the top cloud computing news for 2025. So welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider. My name's Dave, let's get started. So the first and foremost thing I'm gonna say about 2025 was it wasn't much about cloud at all, it was about AI. So AI infrastructure hyperscalers are pouring tens of billions you know, into AI optimized data centers, custom chips, you know, projects like Microsoft OpenAI, Stargate, Supercluster, and all of this uh, innovation or maybe wastes of money we haven't seen yet. But uh, obviously that's where the, the hyperscalers are moving right now. And everybody and anybody is investing in the AI space, almost to the fact that it uh, has taken a lot of the auction out of the room for the uh, other you know traditional cloud computing things out there, which we talked about many times before. So people are focused on data organization, governance models, and really looking to build a cloud infrastructure that support this amazing work that we're supposed to be doing with AI. And that was really kind of the theme of the entire year. Everything had an AI, AI trend to it, whether it was related to AI or not. I think everybody is just chasing the hype. And that's going to be going on well into 2026, if not well into 2027. But we'll see where things go. So the next big story of 2025 was the rise of the Neo Cloud. Uh, which is where GPU providers are breaking the hyperscalers monopoling on AI compute. And so we're seeing uh, folks out there like CoreWeave and Lambda Labs that are offering GPUs as a service, in essence, to support the need or the demand for the AI infrastructure that's out there. So the hyperscalers are charging typically a lot of money for access to GPUs, but of course that comes with a whole complete ecosystem, thousands of other services and functions that exist around the use of GPUs where their cloud providers have seen a need and fulfilled a niche where they're launching just a cloud that just supports AI. And I think we're gonna see the rise of that technology often in the future, but the focus on it in 2025, I think was the big story. So the next big story or trend would be hybrid and multi-cloud has moved from buzzwords uh, to the default operating model uh, that the enterprises and even some of the hyperscalers are pushing. Just a couple of years ago, uh, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud, you know, at a cloud computing conference where a cloud brand was sponsoring the conference was verboten. Not, they, they didn't allow you to say it. Certainly I put in my presentations and things like that and, and uh, proposals to speak at some of these events. And if I got anywhere near the multi-cloud or hybrid cloud stuff, uh, they wanted me to leave it alone and they viewed it as not in their best interest to move in this space. And now we saw just with the reInvent um, uh, Google announcement where they're supporting, you know, multi-cloud interoperability between two hyperscalers, in this case, Google and AWS, obviously the opinions have changed, but the enterprises have think of, I think have always had the same understanding. In other words, if you're leveraging cloud computing, whether you know it or not, you're leveraging a multi-cloud deployment. Not anybody, very few organizations out there, I think if any, I haven't seen one, that are using a single cloud provider without using some of the other cloud providers for some way, shape, or form. And the reason is fairly clear. If you're going to pick best of breed technology, you're going to have an assortment of different hyperscalers out there that have an assortment of different services, and you're going to pick the best and if you're going to pick the best, it's going to be one more. It's more than one cl cloud brand that ends up being your solution. That's all that had occurred. So what was really important in 2025, not that multi-cloud and hybrid cloud was new and emerging. It definitely wasn't. It's been coming on for the last 10 years was the fact that I think the hyperscalers are finally recognizing the fact that that's the way their clouds are being leveraged for the enterprises. Next would be distributed and edge cloud are quietly becoming the new normal for latency sensitive workloads. And we're seeing this kind of slow movement. You wouldn't even know what was going on, but the fact of the matter is, is enterprises over the last few years have been shifting over to edge-based clouds. In other words, they're using private clouds, they're using you know, um, Outpost, which is the AWS uh, edge cloud. They're using Stack, which is a Microsoft edge cloud and basically putting a cloud infrastructure uh, on their own equipment that they own. And I think the edge stuff is really something that's been needed for a long period of time. Many of these enterprises have security issues and compliance issues that they must deal with. And then they're not trustworthy of the 
the hyperscalers uh, hosting their data. In some cases, it's going to be illegal for them to do so. So they're moving over to this kind of hybrid kind of infrastructure. And it's been occurring for the last five years. And I think the breakout year was 2025. You know, you just wouldn't know it because all the AI news that's out there. But many of these enterprises, certainly my clients, have started to put in an investment into these edge cloud infrastructures, a variety of different technologies. But that's certainly changing the game in 2025. So and also a long time coming, sustainability and ener energy constraints have become first class cloud architecture requirements. Um, in 2025, we did see people focusing more on using cloud infrastructure in a more sustainable way. So in other words, they're considering the power consumption, uh, whether it's your equipment or it's the equipment that, you know, is owned by the hyperscalers, it doesn't really matter. They're still producing carbon when you're consuming power. And so what has occurred is we built this into the infrastructure in terms of our accountability, typically on top of FinOps frameworks, where we're looking at the carbon footprint of our particular solution and we're optimizing a solution not only for cost, uh, but also for carbon output. And so we're, you know, least amount of money and therefore least amount of carbon. You're going to find that the uh, financial stuff um, as related to cloud computing and sustainability stuff or carbon output, they're going to be linked. They're joined at the hip. So the, if you really go for optimizing a cloud infrastructure to spend the least amount of money, you're going to be do, producing the least amount of carbon as well. So next would be security, sovereignty, and concentration risks are reshaping cloud decisions uh, more than the features are. And I saw this at, at reInvent uh, a few weeks ago. And the fact of the matter is that, that the sovereignty stuff, digital sovereignty is kind of the buzzword everybody's using, has taken, I think, the industry by storm, whereas many of the hyperscalers are producing their own sovereign versions of their cloud to kind of meet the demand, the fact that in Europe and UK and, and other countries around the world, they're demanding sovereignty. So in other words, they're okay with putting their workloads and data sets onto a cloud provider, but they want to physically know where the stuff is being stored, not just the fact it's out into the cloud and could be anywhere. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, security. Uh, that still becomes a big issue, and they feel more secure if they own the hardware, they know where the hardware is. And also, in many cases, it's going to be related to compliance. So the European Union, uh, they have very strict rules about uh, where PII information can be stored and financial information can be stored. And if for some reason... If you're working with a large cloud provider and it leaves the country, you know, through some sort of a digital transfer, whether it's backup, you know, BCDR activities, things like that, you can get in a lot of trouble. So sovereign cloud providers, certainly the smaller cloud providers, Lido, uh, Lido, I'm sorry, they're a grocery store chain that actually started a cloud. And probably I'm tracking another dozen, you know, small providers, typically under, you know, half a billion dollars in revenue. Um are starting to get more and more recognition in the market because people are realizing that these smaller cloud providers are going to provide them with better sovereignty, better digital sovereignty. And also the big thing, they have it happen to cost less, uh, which is a good thing with the hyperscalers are hugely expensive relative to some of the sovereign cloud providers out there. And by the way, you don't get a break if you're moving to a sovereign version of a hyperscaler. So you're going to pay the same amount of money, uh, even though they may be providing with sovereignty. So next, cloud economics in the AI era demand ruthless architectural discipline, not just better discounting. And this kind of goes to things I've been screaming about for many years, that if we're going to build these very expensive systems and very process excessive systems, which is what AI is, and also data excessive systems, which is what AI is, then we're going to have to think about optimizing the architectures that we're using in the infrastructure uh, to build our cloud frameworks, our non-cloud frameworks around this, this technology. And so we're talking more about optimization of the architecture where that probably that was not, you know, a big item five years ago or even 10 years ago. They were just throwing cloud services at it, throwing money at it, and just in trying to keep it, keep the thing going. And it didn't really matter how they were consuming the resources. And that's why we're seeing repatriation these days. In many cases, people are spending, you know, as much as 10 times what they thought they were on the hyperscalers because of these inefficient architectures and these inefficient application deployments that sit in the cloud. So many of the lifting and shifting we did uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, ended up just being un un under-optimized 
bunch of applications that we have to fix. And so that's why we're seeing this today. And so now that the AI stuff is starting to emerge, hugely resource intensive, hugely infrastructure intensive, people are asking, I think rightfully so, the questions around how we're going to optimize those architectures. And that's primary, you know, primarily, you know, when I get questions from businesses out there, they want to know how that's done. And you do it via architecture, just like anything else. And you have to think through and do some planning in terms of how you're going to use resources and what resources you can bring to bear within your AI system. And that's going to take a lot of work. So anyway, that's it for 2025. Hope you guys had a great year and hope you had a good holiday season and wish you all the luck in 2026. Thank you very much for subscribing and watching this channel. I couldn't be, could not be more grateful. Uh, we're at about, um, you know, a quarter of a million subscribers now and growing all the time. And that's owed to you, uh, you guys checking me out and, you know, keeping in there and uh, giving me encouraging words to keep moving along with this. As long as I keep hearing those encouraging words, I'll keep doing it. So if I miss anything, you know, put it in the comments below uh, and also give me suggestions for next year. What do you want me to cover? Uh, what kind of topics do you think would be most valuable? And I, I do read those and I will consider them as we start moving into 2026 and the topic planning for this particular channel. So anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe and, uh, you know, check out my other videos here. You know, also check out my InfoWorld Cloud Computing blog. You know, check, that, check out my 100 plus LinkedIn learning courses, my two books back there. Um, and let me know how things are going with you and utilization of the cloud. So anyway, have a very happy new year. The YouTube, YouTube algorithm believes that this video is what you should watch next.